Good morning and welcome here this morning. Just a couple announcements to uh, bring to your attention. Next Sunday is our AGM after church. So if you haven't had the opportunity, the annual report is in the back foyers on both sides. You can grab an annual report, have some wonderful reading to see what was happening uh, over the last year. And we'll meet over lunch next week to discuss uh, where things are at in the church. So we'd love your prayers and your involvement uh, next week at our AGM. The following weekend on Saturday, March 25th, there's a ladies fellowship breakfast and there's details in the newsletter if you'd like to sign up for that. And just a reminder that uh, we're continuing to take pictures after church. So if you would like an updated photo for the directory, please head down to the library after the service. We'd love to have an updated photo, um, especially if there's been significant changes in your family where the photo would look really different. So I know I'm on the list of, that needs to get photos done. Um, our youngest wasn't born in the last photo. So if any of those kinds of things apply to you, um, make sure you make some, a moment to do that. Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts now for worship. waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to the Lord and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to the Lord. Listen so that you may live. Let us pray. Lord God, you were present with your people in the desert and you changed a woman's life, Jesus, when you met her at a well. Be present with us now and quench our thirst with your love. Amen. Welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Before we take a moment to greet one another, I'm gonna have you take a seat for a special uh, God at work in our lives. So many of you will know Jackie. Jackie, you've been part of this church, oh, well, well over 10, 10 years, 12 years. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you recently had a very difficult surgery. You had knee surgery not that long ago. Right. And you were having trouble with your mobility and there was mm -hmm. pain. They had the surgery. And as many of us, many people here know that knee surgery, that can be pretty painful. Yeah. Now, that first day when you were in the hospital, you and I, you and I talked later that day. What was happening as you, as you recovered from surgery? Well, what happened is, uh, first I had a warning before I went into the hospital. Uh, my friend Lois White came in a dream to me and said, somebody's blood pressure is out of whack. So I thought, well, I'll phone my sister and see how hers was. And she said she was okay. So that day when I got to the hospital and I was, um, I was under stress, I was in terrible pain. And when I went under, my blood pressure was quite high. And then when I came out of the 
surgery then my uh, my blood pressure was low was awfully low and they were quite worried about it and I um, you put this uh, they put this uh, st st uh, they put this IV on me and uh, to get my blood pressure up. And all of a sudden I started hearing Jackie scared, Jackie scared. And then I thought, you know, I'm hearing something. Now, were, were you scared, Jackie? No. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day I heard Jackie should be scared. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I said to the nurse, I said, I think it's Satan trying to get me upset. And the lady next to my bed, she said, well, I hear something too. It's a lie. It's not true. And then a horn blew. And then I put two and two together. Jesus was calling Satan a liar. And then something told me, sing. So I started singing <laughs> to myself, started singing, Jesus loves me, and what a friend we have in Jesus. And the nurses were looking at the machine, and they says, what are you doing, Jackie? I says, I'm singing. <laughs> and they said, well, keep it up, your blood pressure's going up. <laughs> And when it went up to where they were satisfied, they says, praise the Lord, now we can get some sleep. <laughs> oh, Jackie, <laughs> I have so appreciated over the years when we talk, the way you hear from God yeah. and the way you trust God. It has always encouraged me in my faith as well. And I hope, I know you've been a blessing to people taking the uh -huh. courage the courage to speak in front of all these people. Can we pray for you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jackie's faith and for her willingness to share, to share it with us and to build us up as well. But we pray now that you would keep her from pain, and that you would help her to be diligent in those exercises, and that you would restore her bit by bit to her walking. You would fill her heart with joy and bless her every day. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment to welcome one another in the name of Jesus. Very well done. <laughs> Let's continue in worship as we sing together, Jesus paid it all. Let's sing together hymn number 210, Jesus paid it all.
you may realize this, but in the Bible, there are some themes. Themes are things that happen over and over in the Bible. And one of those themes is something they call a hard heart versus a soft heart. So if you have, when we were particularly talking about a hard heart or a soft heart towards God, so what do you think a person is acting like or doing if they have a hard heart towards God? Any ideas? Being, yes, they do. They might be being bad. Okay, so they're not following the what the Bible says. Yeah. What else might it look like? Guys, any idea? What might it look like if you have a hard heart, Andrew? Hmm. You might want to think about it. What if you have a soft heart towards God? What do you think that might look like? Okay, Caleb? Um, someone doing good and not being cruel. Doing good and not being cruel? Okay, good. And maybe if they would be sharing. Sharing, okay. Happy. Happy, okay. Could be those things, yeah. So today, you know, there's an interesting theme both upstairs in what um, we're learning upstairs. So we have two different groups. We have a woman who is from Samaria who has a soft heart. And when Jesus talks to her, she's like, I finally understand. I want what you have. I want to know you, Jesus. And then we have the Israelites who are in the desert and they're grumpy and mad because they don't have water and they don't have food and they're whining and complaining and they have a hard heart towards God. And then downstairs today, we have another story. So Godly Play, you guys are talking about the children coming to Jesus, just like all of you come here. And you come here ready to learn and ready to listen. I see your soft hearts. And then we're also learning in Oasis, we're learning about the plagues of Egypt. And um, do you think Pharaoh, who was the guy in charge of Egypt, did he have a hard heart or a soft heart? Hard heart. Yeah, it talks about that over and over again. So. Let's get ready to go downstairs. Let's just say a prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us all today. And we pray that each child here and each adult here would have a soft heart in places where we are hard and don't want to listen, not just in the right direction so that we listen to you. We thank you for this day and all we have to learn from you. Amen. Good morning. In Jeremiah, we hear God's decree. My people have committed a compound sin. They've walked out on me, the fountain of fresh flowing waters, and then dug cisterns, cisterns that leak, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Our prayer of confession was written by Reverend Renee C. Jackson. Let us pray. God of mercy, hear the prayers of your thirsting people. For every time we have attributed your miracles in our lives to our own hands alone, forgive us, we pray. For every time we promised to trust you, but turned to our own way, when your response did not come soon enough or in the way we expected. Grant us mercy, O oh God, for the many opportunities to extend forgiveness that we have refused. Show us what it means to love again, dear Lord. For each way we put our own understandings above your wisdom, for each time we resist your command to be reconciled with those who believe differently from us, direct us in the way of peace, we pray. For our silent sins, our quiet acts of violence, 
and our indifference to the suffering around us. Forgive us, loving one, and quench our thirst with your grace. Remake us into vessels of tenderness and compassion. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and, irrig and to irrigate your parched fields, and I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children, says the Lord in Isaiah. Therefore, we may ask of Christ to give us the living water that quenches the dryness of our souls. In this, we know we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. morning. The Old Testament reading this morning is found in Exodus 17 verses 1 to 5. I'm sorry, 1 to 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? 
they are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? The responsorial reading is from Psalm 95 and it's found on page four of your bulletin. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into the Lord's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord's with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In the Lord's hand are the depths of the earth the heights of the mountains are the Lord's also. The sea is the Lord's, for the Lord made it, and the dry land which his hands formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for the Lord is our God. We are the people of the Lord's pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to the Lord's voice. Do not. <clears throat> when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, <clears throat> they shall not enter my rest. The epistle lesson is found in Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. 
and it's found in John 4, verses 5 to 14, and then again in 23 and 42. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. Verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? And the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed on his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly 
the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We are on a journey through Lent, and we are reflecting, thanks to Henry Nouwen's words, how all of our life is, in one sense, a journey toward God. It is the journey, in one sense, that the prodigal son makes as he journeys home, where he can once again be with his father and share everything that his father has. It is, in another sense, the journey that the older son makes or is invited to make at any rate, to understand that he is home and has everything to share with his father. Lent is a time when we fast. We fast in order to learn that it is not only by bread that we live. Jesus said, I have food that you do not know of. My food is to do the work of the one who sent me. Now we take that as metaphor, and yet that has not always been the teaching of the church, but rather as the fathers taught, our very bodies rely on our spiritual health. And so when we are nurtured spiritually, that is of benefit to our bodies. And we sense that. We talk about energy that that we have, and we understand that some days we feel a little bit more energetic and others we don't. And that doesn't always have much correlation to do with whether or not we've eaten. We understand that there is a connection between our spiritual health and our physical health. That when we are serving God and drawing closer to God, we have food that others do not know of. But while we are on this journey, it is important to stay hydrated. It's easy to run out of water. We've been on several trips, and you'd think I would learn, or my, I'm going to blame Heather. Why am, I, why am I always taking the crap blame for things? It's my wife's fault. We never bring enough water, especially with children. We were, we were cycling last summer, and the temperature was hovering around 40 degrees, and we had cycled about 50 kilometers, and we had a map showing us the stages of the trip, and, and that there were these points where you could refill your water bottles. We had five liters with us and we were diligently filling them up until we got to this stretch where there was a, a long gap between villages and we got to the one and there was no water available and we were running out. And we, we ended up just knocking on different doors. Finally at the city hall, it was a Sunday, there was someone there and they, they let us fill up. Boy, it was a nervous, a nervous thought that we would have probably survived but we would have been in rough shape for sure. When you're thirsty and you can't find water, it can be deadly. We're told our bodies, I mean, in popular uh, conversations, we say something like, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% water. I think I've heard 90. I mean, at some point, we're just, we can't be that much water. But 50 to 60% we're made up of water, as if there was a well inside of us. And we understand that if we deplete that well, if it gets used up, we begin to wear out. We begin to fail. And eventually, we just, we just can't go on. Now, this is the physical thirst. But it is also as if within us is a spiritual well of water that is equally essential for our life and for our energy. It's this well that everyone has inside that they draw on. It's the well out of which we draw on in order just to carry on sometimes. Things are not going well and we just need to carry on and that takes everything we have, even just to get up. There is a well we draw on out of which we love. We love God. There is a well within, within us that we draw on in order to love others. And sometimes it feels 
And perhaps it is as if that well goes dry. We are in danger of beginning to fail spiritually. We are struggling to carry on in our faith. We are struggling to find the means to love God, to love others. It is perhaps easiest to find, to recognize the signs of physical thirst. Our lips get hard and dry. Our mouths get hard and dry. We begin to feel tired. Maybe you develop a headache. Equally, there are spiritual signs of thirst. Life begins to feel flat and dry. Books or music, scripture and fellowship that once seemed so lively doesn't touch in the same way. You're not able to engage. When it comes to life, you feel worn out and empty. And you may even experience physical pain, heartache. In both of these situations, what's hardest is to have compassion on others. We become hard-hearted, unwilling to consider what God's purpose is in all of this, unwilling to listen to God and to seek after God. We become hard-hearted towards other people. We begin to say things like, everything I have, I've earned myself. What's wrong with these other people? Why don't they carry on with life? I don't have time to help people. I need to look after myself first. Physically, our body hardens when we don't have water. And spiritually, it's our hearts that harden. In the stories that we read this morning, or we didn't read them, Esther read for us this morning, we had stories of people interacting with God in the midst of their thirst. And the stories go back and forth between both this physical thirst and the spiritual thirst. The people of God were journeying through a desert. No kidding, they were thirsty. 30 to 40 degrees, hot weather, dry wind, and no water. The law, the Psalms, and the prophets, though, say that there was also a dry point spiritually for the people. Their hearts were hardened. They rebelled against God. They rebelled against moral Moses, and they quarreled with each other. As we heard from the Psalms, they hardened their hearts. Now, maybe we want to say, no kidding. <laughs> Can you blame them? They were thirsty. How many times had they been thirsty already? How many times did they have to put up with this? Why couldn't their journey end why couldn't the water just be there? Why did they have to constantly look for it and wait for it? Why did it have to get to this point where they were so thirsty? Maybe it would be better just to go back. We tend, perhaps, perhaps out of compassion, to soften the responsibility of people in the midst of trials and hardships. It's only understandable that you would let your heart, that your heart would be hardened in this moment. But at the same time, don't we also gently and cautiously, when we seem like we can, we make a suggestion when someone is suffering about good responses to their suffering, to their grief, to their sadness, and to depression. If we think there's an opportunity to say, I know you want to respond in this way, but this way will lead to life and health. God's people, we might want to say, had a choice. They had, after all, been led by God by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. They had seen the waters part. They had walked through on dry ground. They had watched Egypt's army be annihilated. They had been provided with food and water all along. In this moment, why couldn't they have just held on just a bit longer and trusted that of course God would provide water for them. But they hardened their hearts. The woman at the well who came, who met Jesus, 
or who was met by Jesus, came presumably because she also was thirsty, and perhaps she was drawing water for others who were thirsty. But Jesus said these words to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. As we read all of this encounter that the woman has with Jesus, it's hard to really pinpoint what it was that Jesus said that so transformed her. These simple words that he said, and yet she responds by heading straight back to her village and saying, come and meet this man. And while she is doing this, let's take a moment and look back at the well. What do we see there beside Jesus and the well? It's the bucket. She's left it behind. And presumably, John points this out as if to underline that she was no longer thirsty. Being with Jesus and listening to Jesus had filled her, had quenched her thirst in a way that's hard for anyone, John or otherwise, to explain. Instead, you have to become like the villagers who came for themselves to meet Jesus and said, now it is not only because of your words, but we have met Jesus. We understand now. He has met our thirst. Our life is a journey towards God. We will pass through deserts. I know many of you are passing through deserts now. And our hearts can become hardened towards God, towards others. Jesus stood up at a festival later and said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink. And as the scriptures have said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. It is not just for our sakes that we renew ourselves by coming to Jesus in prayer, by opening the scriptures, by coming to church. It is so that we might share this water with others and be a blessing to them. Paul put it a different way. We know that our suffering produces endurance. Our endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. Physical thirst is, as I said, easy to recognize and easy to address throughout the day in Regina. Who doesn't ever find themselves but within a few steps of a tap or a store where you could buy something to drink? You imagine someone saying, it's, I'm thirsty, it's hopeless, and they just throw themselves on a couch and say, I guess I'm going to die. What can I do? I don't have anything to drink with me. And this is obviously absurd. You would say, like, you could take four steps. I'm trying not to throw my sons under the bus here, but at any rate, you could take four steps and uh, the kitchen is right there. Or you could help yourself. No, nobody knows, everybody knows what to do in those moments. But what, when it comes to spiritual thirst, when it comes to being aware that we are entering a period of dryness or emptiness, it seems that we are more likely to just thirst and do nothing about it. There is a vicious cycle when we are becoming hardened. We are lacking the energy to do the very things that we know we need to do. We ought to go see someone that we know loves us. We ought to pause and to pray and to open up our hearts. We ought to open up scripture. We ought to go to church. We ought to find ways to serve someone else. And yet, it just seems like it's too much. Or perhaps even bitterness and cynicism set in. 
and we refuse to do any of those things. After all, everything we've done for God, after all we've done, and now we're facing this again. We also have this habit of substituting, finding substitutes for meeting our thirst. As we heard from the prophet Jeremiah, instead of going to God for the water, we have dug our own cisterns, stagnant water, stale water that are leaky. We look at short-term pleasure to help get us through the moments. Or we fill our times to distract, to distract ourselves with work and entertainment. Or perhaps we just seek oblivion, something that will help us forget and not know what's going on. Or perhaps we nurture anger. There are angers directed at the government or society or an employer or a friend. It's all their fault. Let's go back to the physical first for a moment. Because maybe it actually isn't so obvious and easy to meet our thirst, our physical thirst. When I, when I had um, kidney stones, <laughs> I was challenged to, maybe you should be drinking more water. <laughs> and I thought, I drink plenty of water. And they said, well, about two to three liters a day. That's a lot of water. I had no idea until I started trying to drink two to three days, there was no way I was ever drinking enough water before finding out the hard way that it was important. <laughs> it, there's no excuses for not drinking that much water and that much fluid. We're, we're surrounded with options. But I wonder how many of us are doing that every day. Well, John, we have a, he's a new evangelist for this. He's, he's He's sold. He's got a new bounce in his step, and he's enjoying himself at Bells. And he said, it's all about drinking more water, I think. <laughs> it seems to be working for me. Perhaps, though, we just are satisfied with a sip from a fountain, a cup of coffee, something with lunch or supper, just a sip here or there. And we know what we ought to do, but we struggle to do it. And if everything's going all right, it's not a problem. But if you hit a desert with that attitude you're going to be in trouble quickly. It's the same with spiritual thirst. We are surrounded by God's grace with options to meet our thirst. Jesus calls us, walks with us, and is there to quench our thirst. But often our habit is to be satisfied with a sip here and there. Now, it's one thing to do that, and to get through life in your faith when all things are going well. But when we hit a desert in our faith, it can kill our spiritual life, our faith, our hope, and our love for others. What do we do when we're dry? Here in this province, especially if you garden, you've had a lot of experience with dry ground. After a couple weeks of no rain and heat, the ground here becomes hard as concrete. Those cracks open up. I don't know if you've ever watched what happens when you pour water onto that hard, hard, dry ground right in the midst of a downpour or if you turn the sprinklers on heavy. What happens to that water? It just shoots off of the soil to either side. The same thing happens with plants in a pot. I worked in a garden center and every once in a while a pot would get missed and the plant would completely dry out. If you poured water on that pot, that first little bit of water, it just pours off the side and runs off, and the plant inside remains dry. If we are in a desert, if we are dry ground spiritually, what we need is the hardest thing to do, but it's what we need. It's a long, slow, soaking rain. The first bit of water that comes down, it just runs off. We need to soak in it. The water needs to come down and down and down until slowly it begins to penetrate. It takes hours. And eventually the soil has water in itself. Whether we are in good times or bad times, we need to develop habits of drinking two liters of spiritual water daily. That way we'll be ready when the hard times come. And when they come, we need it more. We need to soak in 
Jesus' presence more. Reading the Psalms daily. Reading Jesus' words in the gospel daily. Coming to Jesus in the hardest times and just even just opening up our hands and doing our best to try and find the words to express what's going on. Saying anything bluntly to God until you find the right words. And then waiting and listening longer. Set a timer if you've never sat for long in prayer and you're not sure what to do. Make sure to come to church in those times. Don't avoid people just because you're not able to say things are going great. Is there a good book that once fed you spiritually? Read it again. Is there a friend that you know loves you who has built you up before? Ask them for coffee. Some of you will know Roberta Richmond. Ron and Roberta have been part of this church and Argyle Road Baptist Church for many, many decades. You'll know how over the years they have had a long road with their family, their children and grandchildren, and have given their life over to caring for them. In fact, through their family, they have reached out and cared for many others in the neighborhood and in our city. Perhaps you heard Ron speaking to city council last December, pleading with them to have compassion. Through their significant challenges in life, as they enter their 80s, they are still working away, hoping and praying, laboring. It's as if Ron and Roberta have a secret spring within themselves. The other day, I heard this story from someone else. So this wasn't Roberta <laughs> blowing her own horn. Roberta was gone off to help her family again. And as she was driving past a bus stop, she saw a woman, an elderly woman, sitting there with large garbage bags, presumably full of recycling. She went and helped, poured herself out, and presumably tired and hoping for a nap, as I hear many of us enjoy as we get older. She came by that bus stop and noticed it had been a long time. The woman was still there. So she checked in her heart and thought, I'll stop. And she said to the woman, are you waiting for a bus? And the woman said, the bus has come by already. It didn't even slow down for me. Maybe they thought I was just resting or warming up. Perhaps it was a bus driver whose heart was hard and hardened. The woman did look rough. But Roberta said, where are you headed? Well, I was hoping to go to Sarkhan and then home. Roberta said, I can take you here. And they loaded up everything and got in the car. It was a cold day. The woman was fortunate that Roberta came by. As they got talking, it turned out this was a grandmother, and they had lots in common. This grandmother spent all of her time caring for her grandchildren as well. And she used the money from the recycling to help meet, make ends meet for her family. They spent the time together. Roberta took her and drove her home. The woman prayed for Roberta in thanks. Two women who have not hardened their hearts but, thanks to knowing Jesus, have a well springing up within them. And in one day, their true glory will be revealed. Let us not harden our hearts, but let us use the many means of grace that we know about, that are available to us, to spend time with Jesus, to find our thirst met, so that we can like others we know, go out and serve and share, share this life-giving water. And to God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
This morning, for our prayers of the people, when you hear, Lord, in your mercy, please respond collectively with, hear our prayer. Let us pray now for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We think especially of those in service and leadership here at First Baptist, of our partners in ministry in the CBWC and CBM, for those who are leading and involved in Curios or Katepo Lake Camp. We think of the Boutros family in Lebanon. May your spirit be present in all they do. Provide them with wisdom and strength and the energy needed to do your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly and in the service of others and for your honor and your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. We think now and pray especially for Flyness and Mary Jane's sister-in-law, who both have been dealing with cancer. We pray for Amelia. We pray for Laurel as she continues to need healing from her car accident. We pray for Jackie, for Judy, and for Diane as they heal from surgeries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to you your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that they may share with all your saints in the eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We recognize that these gifts are only a portion of the blessings that God has poured out among us. Lord, we give these back to you so that your work may be done here on earth. Amen. now as you go, go with the blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Good to see you again. Oh, good to see you. Hey, strangers. How are you in? Hey, I heard there's a bit of delay with the painting.